All right, well, welcome to another exciting day of software estimation and measurement. Uh, today we're going to be talking about effort. We've been referencing effort throughout the semester already, and now we're going to talk about how to estimate it. Um, there have been some questions about midterm, so I thought I'd talk about those now. So midterm uh, uh, days are, are suggested to be a week from today, next Friday, and the, the Monday following that. Um, my plan is to have a project based off of uh, estimating size and complexity to be completed instead of having a, a formal midterm. And so, and have that due. The, my current target is March 12th, Monday, March 12th. Um, any feedback on that idea? Or no, please give us an exam. I, I love exams. I hate projects. Or no, thank you. I'd re much rather have a project than an exam. You're welcome to come talk with me in my office or send me an email. Um, uh, along those lines, of course, more details will, will be given out short, shortly um, uh, on a web page with an, an email. No. No. Um, to, the, you could interact with uh, people at a high level, um, but not specifics. Does that make sense? Okay. That, that's a fair question. And, uh, and one I'd probably ask if I was a student. Okay. All right. So today it, we're going to start covering um, estimating effort. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to, I wanted to, it's an important topic. And so I wanted to give it the time needed. So I'm, I've tried to break it in half. So we'll talk about some of the methods today. So, um, and then we'll talk about some of them next week. The software estimation book by Steve McConnell, that, that is an optional text for extra reference, okay? Um, so, um, just to, to bring that up again uh, on the schedule for next week, okay. Um, so this is based on Chapter 6 of Software Measurement Estimation by Linda M. Lyard and M. Carol uh, Brennan. And so, um, what is effort? What is, when we talk about software management, what is effort? Input. Input? Okay. Anything else? So uh, if I was going to ask this on a, a final, for example, <coughs> oh, sorry, hold on, cough, cough. <coughs> okay, there. So if I was going to ask that on a, a final, I'd be looking for something like the estimated, or you could say predicted, or the Required, it kind of depends on your stance. Of, are we talking about uh, in the future, in the past? Required number of staff months, days, hours, years, hopefully not millennium, you know, hopefully it's not that big, to complete a project. Okay, so it's the number of staff months, number of staff years. Okay, that, that's effort. How much effort is it going to take to complete this project? This is probably the most popular project. It's kind of hard to know exactly, you know, what is the most popular. But it, it's probably the most popular. Why do you think that is? Why would this be the most popular metric? Oh, sorry. Why would this be the most popular metric so because based on that all the other metrics are, are defined because uh, effort is the reason for output 
in terms of it, we're we're talking about delivering the project. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to deliver the project, you actually have to look at the report. Yes, to say okay, we, we companies are involved with uh, our their their real goal. It, whether or not this comes through in their advertising is about profit. Mm -hmm. It's it's about costs. So management is most concerned about costs and delivery, and delivery, as was mentioned so that you can start getting revenue on your product. You can't start charging people for it until you deliver it. And so they want to know what what are our costs and what are going to be our profits. Let's, let's project that. Let's get the product out the door so that we can start earning money on it, okay? So it can be sold. So then what is included in effort? We said staff months or staff years. So what do we include in effort? Is the time needed to draft and refine specifications uh, included? Uh, is it only development? And testing. Uh, what about the staff that it, in a large organization, larger than a company that would fit in this this room? What about the the staff in the metrics and or the quality divisions? Do we count them? Do, are they are they? Are they just assigned to this project or not? And so these are questions that need to be addressed and spelled out. Uh, what are we estimating? Does it include it or not in our estimates so that we're clear? Because if if you're just if you give your boss an estimate that's only development and testing, and the boss interprets it as everything, and you say, Hey, I need a hundred staff months, and they say, Wow. That's that's great, and and they they're thinking a hundred staff months from then it'll be done, and you're like, oh no no that's for development testing. I need you know twenty four specification, and I I we have the overhead of of you know a constant ten over here. They said no no that wasn't part. Of it. So we just need to be clear about what are we talking about, okay? Now um, I think it was the first time we met. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so to be able to accurately estimate uh, effort, we need to understand the size and the complexity of the project. And that's what we're, we're getting at with the, this whole chapter here, this, this whole um, theme. Now let me reiterate what we talked about in our first lecture, that there is a, a difference between estimates and targets. Remember we talked about this? Targets are given by management and they're not estimates. It's you will deliver by this date. That's not an estimate. That, that's, a, that's a requirement. That's a, a, a target or we, we um, and, and sometimes we blur those those definitions but in this class we'll use the a target is not a definition. It's, uh, it's a business need or request. So if we treat targets as estimates or allow them to influence our estimate, then we can get into trouble. And when it doesn't work, we're going to say, well, what went wrong? You know, we didn't have this or that. It's, well, it wasn't really an estimate. And so that, that's the, the first part. Do you see how there's some good transferable skills here? By transferable skills, we mean you can apply this to other areas of your life, other areas of your professional life, or to other domains that aren't even software uh, project management. Um, and so th that can be one cause of overruns of not making the estimate because the estimate wasn't really a target. Another cause of overruns um, is surprises. And um, what would we mean by surprises? 
something that wasn't anticipated. Well, now, it um, we should plan for a certain degree of unknown and and anticipate certain things that are predictable. For example, you could predict that there's going to be new feature requirements. Okay, so that shouldn't be seen as so much as a surprise. That you should assume that that's the case. And depending on your client or your boss, you might say, "Oh my goodness, let's." I'm estimating 25% or no, they're really good. They go to bat and they push back, push back. I'm only anticipating about 5% change. And so um, that shouldn't be, hopefully isn't a surprise and we can just anticipate the unknown. It would be unwise to say, oh, I'm assuming this is going to go as such. That also applies to life, right? You have a map for life. I'm going to graduate this day. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to make this much money. I'm going to have these relationships. And we should be able to be a little bit of flexible and anticipate that it might not go exactly that way. Okay. Um, so in all of this, don't forget to use common sense. Uh, does this is this going to really work? Is this going to and good engineering? judgment uh, as you make calls and do this okay so so that's our introduction to the topic so now let's talk about some methodologies and models okay software estimation methodology Okay, so there are six categories of which the um, methodologies are broken up into. Okay, the first one is expert opinion. We're going to talk about um, most of these today, but not all of them. Expert opinion. We're going to talk about using bench, benchmark data. We're going to talk about analogy, proxy points, uh, custom models, I think we're going to save for next week, and algorithmic models as well. Okay. But these are going to define the outline. What we're going to talk about. So let's. Um, so uh, with with so many categories, which method or out of which method should we? Out of which category? Which which should we use? Which method to use? Anybody have some thoughts? We got six categories. Wouldn't it be nice if there's just one, right? Then it's it's easy. So the the answer. The um, best practices is a term, and may not be the, the best, the, the most favorable answer, but the best practices use three or more, okay? Because in the amount of multiple witnesses, we'll have our answer in terms of, okay, well, I use this approach and I got this estimate. I use this approach and I got the same estimate. That's good. You use three approaches, you got the same estimate either. Well, are you doing it right? <laughs> or, But it, it helps us to understand, because they're not all equivalent. If they were, they'd all be the same. But it allows us to triangulate on our estimate to, to make sure we have a good grasp. It also empowers you to be able to push back to management to say, hey, no, this is why this is the case. And if you'll notice, while they the three methods don't agree in all situations, they all agree in this this area. So we really we really need that time. We really need that many people assigned to to this part, and it it, it allows you to have some some backing to your estimate, which can be important to defend your position because if you lose that fight early, then um, you're going to take responsibility for it later. Okay, so let's talk about expert opinion. Okay, so expert opinion usually gives 
the best estimate. And but with one caveat, if you have what? True experts. Okay. So if you're a startup company and you've gotten this awesome bid and you've never done this work before, that might not be the best way to estimate the project because you are you may have hired people that have a lot of energy um, and skill, but not necessarily experience and um, with, with this in project estimation, so you, you need to have true experts. Okay, there there are two general ways to approach uh, expert opinion. One is work and activity decomposition. Okay, and what this and and the other is system decomposition. Okay, so let's talk about work and activity decomposition. Here, this is focused on the task to be performed. Okay, so we're focused. We're, we're focusing on the task. You can already guess what the the other one is. And so this this has a solid track record of being applicable. As I mentioned, it usually gives the best estimate. And so this is probably again, it's hard to know. Probably the most widely used. Um, Okay, and so the way it works is we have an estimator that is a person, usually the person going to be responsible for it, right? So they're very vested because they know that this estimate, that they need to live up to this estimate or their group does. So an estimator, a person, outlines the required effort by area of responsibility. And so we're going to break up that area into requirements, design, coding and unit testing, system testing, project management and administration, and then training and documentation. So I want you to pause real quick. Uh, next time you have a a project you're working on, whether for a, a job, a part-time job, or a, a, a school-related project, do you how do you think of a project? Do you cover all these areas? Do you spend time on understanding the requirements? Do you spend time on design? Or do you jump straight to that third one, coding, and only do the first half? Now, now I'm not looking for any confessions here today. Um, but I think this is noteworthy. This is how good software um, management uh, it, uh, it should be done. And so apply it to the projects you're doing now, say the midterm. So make sure you understand the requirements very well. Make a design for it. It will save you time now, yeah? which is um, you're probably enrolled in other classes. You, uh, some of you may work. Some of you may have family responsibilities. You might have other things, uh, volunteer responsibilities. You have other things going on. Some of you like to sleep and eat, you know, other life things. I, I get that. So design will save you time. It won't feel like it, but it will. Uh, and then don't forget to do testing. That is uh, surprisingly too often overlooked. Now, project management and administration, when you're the manager and the developer, you should have, that should be fairly easy. And then training and documentation, did you give time to the, the report and, and making sure that you, you've documented that? You, now, a, a class project is different than a 100 team organization in terms of uh, training and documentation or a product being out there. Um, but do consider those. Okay, so then um, here's a visual of how to do this. Who has used a Gantt chart before?
Okay, that's weird. Okay, so anybody heard of a Gantt chart before? You have you used it? Operating system class. Okay, good. That uh, that was how they dis described scheduling. It is using a Gantt chart. No, I I know about Gantt chart. We learned it in school. Okay. Okay, good, good. That, okay, good. Then I have an excuse to explain. So a Gantt chart is a visual way to uh, describe the details of a project. So this is an extremely simple Gantt chart where we just have uh, boxes. We have the task on the left and then we have a time frame on the top. And so here the blue boxes, purple, blue, on my screen they look blue. I wonder what they look like in the video. Um, a true blue maybe. Um, they indicate, and, and here, um, this came from tutorials point, um, and so here this project has uh, no project, um, that the, there, there isn't any requirements, um, I, guess, I guess that's in, in planning, and so the, they're saying, hey, this is going to take three weeks, now what isn't represented here is how much staff, so we can't say effort, we can only say time frame, but um, and this is just a sim simple introductory example. But this says planning is going to take through weeks one and three. Design is going to start sometime in, time, in week three. And it's going to take three weeks. Coding will start only after um, design. Often you'll see arrows showing dependencies on which ones are independent and which one is waiting for the other one. Um, and you can see this is kind of a waddle, waterfall approach, the tr a traditional software development approach to this, uh, where we're, we're planning and then we design and then we code and then we're testing. Luckily, we don't wait till we're all done coding to test. And then uh, there is time allocated to delivery, so that could be uh, pro um, like training and documentation and, and things like that. Um, and so it's a way to represent it now. Uh, to to do effort estimation, as I alluded to, this is this isn't enough here. What we need to do is instead of filling out a, a Gantt chart like this, we need to put values here instead of an assumed one or all or a hundred percent. We need to put values, especially imagine a hundred person organization. You don't have all a hundred people assigned to planning and all a hundred people uh, later assigned to design you might have your really strong planning people and they might be assigned to that project and then they are assigned to planning other projects. So we would put it we would put an estimate here and an expert would say okay I've looked over the specifications, the requirements, the environment, all of that very carefully and from my experience Nate, that's probably what makes him an F expert um, of you know managing 20 of these projects already in similar environments this is going to require um, planning is going to require 100 staff months or w whatever the case is um, and of course this could be broken out uh, in more detail and design is going to require this much right, right, at this phase and then that allows us to break it down and then we total up all of the estimates okay so this tends to work very well okay as I mentioned so this works very well with the caveat is you have an expert but there, there's one challenge with this approach and that is that it's hard to defend estimates using this approach and that's because the um, they're subjective. They're subjective, so we, we haven't quantified a number. It's we've used their expert opinion, and so then if management challenges that expert opinion, it's just an opinion. And so that, for example, they could, the, the boss could say, hey, uh, why does testing need to take three weeks? And you say, well, that from my experience, it needs that long. And they might say, we need it in two. It's like, well, I'm sorry, I, I'm really, you know, I, I've seen this before, but 
it, it it's a, could be a little awkward because um, it's uh, one opinion against another. Okay, so that's a focus on the, the tasks to be performed. Here, a, a system decomposition is focused on the components and the modules of the system. Okay, and this also has a solid track record. And the way it works is uh, we break up the project into modules and submodules. Okay, and then we make estimates for each submodule and total the estimates. Now, if we total all the estimates for the submodules, then we have the estimates for the modules. And if we have all the estimates for the modules, we have the estimate for the project. Okay. And um, I, I remember when I was um, in college. And uh, the, so here, here's a little uh, tangent we're going to go down. Okay, um, and being assigned a project, and I felt like it was this insurmountable mountain that I had to climb, partly because of the time frame, right? The schedule is just, uh, it's due at five, <laughs> and I have to get to there. And uh, I've realized that, yes, that, that can feel overwhelming, but if we break it up into smaller tasks, then it, we can uh, perform better and be able to accomplish it. Well, that's the same approach here. We're dividing and conquering, and it might be insurmountable to uh, make a, a good estimate for the entire project, but if we can estimate all the submodules, then we've ac accomplished that. Now, I, um, maybe the actually the most common slash popular method is pulling a number out of thin air, meaning just make one up, now, we need to avoid that. We're trying to take a very disciplined approach here. But do understand that that does happen. Okay? People will, oh, well, that estimate was due today. Oh, I've done this before, so let's do this. No, we're talking about a disciplined approach. Okay, So, so that did not make the list as, as options here. You can't use that as one of your three. Okay, So expert opinion is not pulling it out of thin air. Now, there's some really cool um, methods that can help to... Um, Im improve these and they're called uh, Delphi and they're called the wideband Delphi method okay and again uh, these are great transferable skills and so Delphi anybody heard of the term Delphi before but but not quite sure the reference okay so any uh, uh, ancient Greek Yes, yes. And it, so it's named after the oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece, where um, this oracle would answer your question correctly, maybe cryptically, but would answer it if you had enough gold. Okay? And so um, the, that, that's, that's where this, um, the method gets its name. So, so Delphi, there's also software named Delphi. And so it was developed at the Rand Corporation in 1948. Was that a good year for anybody? Okay. Um, and so uh, here's how it works. Each member of a small team, okay, if it's a large team, it's not going to work as well, is given the specifications, uh, the goals and assumptions, among other things, um, ab about the project. Okay, so th they're given that, and what they do is they anonymously generate an estimate. Okay, and then the 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 estimates are shared amongst all groups uh, uh, amongst the team anonymously and you can say oh ooh, ooh, they put a lot more you know effort they estimate a lot higher effort in that area or oh they didn't do any in planning and then it allows them to rethink and and um, and then the the process 
is iterated until consensus is reached. Okay, so that worked fairly well, but there's there was an improvement on it, and uh, again from the Rand Corporation in the 1970s, is uh, each member of a small team is given the specifications, goals, and assumptions of the project. They anonymously generate an estimate. The estimates are shared. You can see why it's called the wideband. It retains the Delphi name. But then here's a, a key point, and that is that team members can ask the team as a whole about specifics of an estimate. And the, there's a, a moderator, so this is all done anonymously. Okay, and then the, the process is iterated until a consensus is reached. So they can have a little discussion of, um, you know, there's, there's three of us here, there's four of us here, three of us mentioned this, but um, one of them mentioned that, you know, it seems like an outlier or what, what do we think about that? You know, should we all be increasing our estimates or decreasing them? And to be able to talk about that and, um, and so that there is a moderator here, and part of the moderator's job is so that you don't have um, a minority voice that is squashed by someone that is perceived to be um, uh, more in authority or something like that. So to give each estimate equal voice, so that we, um, consensus isn't reached based on seniority, for example, but more based on the virtue of the the estimate, okay? Do you see how this could apply to other planning activities as well? If something is very important or you needed to come to consensus, you could anonymously talk about plans and then reach a consensus on it. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Transferable skills. Okay, so um, that's the expert opinion, okay? So now let's uh, switch to using benchmark data. Okay, so if you already have a size estimate, we've already talked about size estimates. So I'm hoping that when I said that, you thought lines of code or function points is just automatic. If you already have that and you have benchmark data, then this is going to be easy. Okay. Um, and so, oh boy, I deleted this my notes. Okay, so um, this is uh, one of the best methods to be able to use because we are leveraging something that's in the past, which is no longer an estimate. So if we can use that as our benchmark, um, if we can rely on that, then it can be done quickly and um, uh, in a very robust fashion. Okay, so um, there was an article published a uh, couple of years ago. 2004 here, the, the article uh, in uh, the Department of Defense's Software Tech, uh, July 2004, uh, Industry Software Cost Benchmarks and Productivity, oh sorry, Productivity Benchmarks by Donald Reifer. Um, and so he um, had, uh, he, he has um, benchmarked over 600, here this table is 600 projects uh, out of a database of 1,800 that they were the most recent, which um, is uh, applicable. Uh, you, want, you want more recent data. I, I think you've got a sense of this area in some ways has been around for a long time. And so uh, my father has a degree in computer science. And so he tells stories about when uh, putting my oldest sister 
in the car seat on the card reader because it would like shake. And so it was kind of like, you know, the, the vibration motions that you can now buy in, um, in baby products, but it was a, apparently a gentle rocking um, motion. I'm not old enough to have used the card reader, okay? Um, and, but, uh, so software development was a little different when my dad was a student as compared to now at, when you're a student. Um, so we have this table here that's broken up by domain, and you can see there's an emphasis on military applications. Uh, this is, after all, published in the Department of Defense. Um, and so with a total, as I mentioned, 600 projects, and then they have a size of thousands of uh, lines of source code. And we have the, the range there for the 75 projects or the 125. And then we have productivity as uh, source lines of code by SM, staff month. Okay. And then just to give an example application of what it would be. So here's how we read this, okay? So if we have a project, say uh, we've been hired by a, a military um, organization um, to produce some software, it, is it dealing with something that was airborne? If, if it was, then the, and our size fits in this range, which is a huge range, right? And so if it's between 20,000 and 1.3 million lines of code, then um, the average productivity of lines per code per staff month is only 105, right? This is something you don't want to get wrong. You don't want it to accidentally get the wrong target or to uh, blow up prematurely, for example, on launch, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, this can be much lower than, say, working with data, which isn't going to kill somebody, probably, uh, if you get it wrong. Um, let's see. What's our lowest one? Okay, missiles. Okay. Uh, and notice here, okay, so telecommunications, we can, uh, web business, we can crank out with, and, and data processing is a very high. So you can see, and so military in general is lower because it needs to work right um, for it to, to work. So we're talking about airborne project, and so we could estimate that, okay, based on our size, we could, at least as a first approximation, say, we're going to estimate that we can knock out 105 lines of code, source code, per staff month. Okay, therefore we need um, so much, so many staffs. Okay, so let's apply this. Okay, so let's say you are are working with a professor in a maybe for a doctorate in the domain of computational biology. Okay. And you have this this project and this project the estimated size of the project maybe you're writing a grant proposal and you're trying to figure things out. The estimated size of the project is 10,000 lines of source code. Okay? So what's your estimate of the effort? How are we going to answer that? Computational biology project with a professor and uh, 10,000 uh, 10, uh, source lines of code. Line, source, yeah. How do we apply this? Do we estimate effort? Pulling it out of thin air is not an option. By the way, if I ask this on an exam or something, I, I don't need just the answer. I'm more concerned about how you got to the answer and especially like assumptions made. 
please spell those out. Um, so like I was grading quiz for chapter four recently and I realized I, I, I needed to have assumptions spelled out because you got the right answer but it was how'd you get to that point uh, and did you consider this or um, did you realize that there is a variance here and that while uh, while you acknowledge that there's going to, based on your estimate, there's a range here, I'm going to give my boss a single answer. So the, those, those sort of things of not so much of, I guess, uh, what, what you're going to tell your boss, but what is going into your decision of what to tell your boss is what I'm more interested in. Okay, so computational biology project, 10,000 lines of code. Where are we? All the, you know, there's like... Um, what, 15 times uh, 5 or 4? There's like 60 numbers on there, up there. What, what, or I'm all more than that because we got ranges. So there's like 100 numbers up there. Which ones do we use? <coughs> so how do, how, do we, how do we apply this? What's our first question? First question is which domain, right? Which domain are we in? Because that's how we read this table. We have to go through the first, the left column there and establish which domain. Automation, banking, command and control, data processing, eh, some computational biology projects could be safe <coughs> in there. Environment tools, no, it's not, uh, maybe it's military. <laughs> um, I, should we say it's scientific? You're working with a professor, so I could see it being, uh, I'd say a lot of my, the research uh, uh, code that I do would be uh, scientific. Now, some of scientific of what I do is data processing. Uh, there's some overlap there, but it, so let, let's say it's a scientific code, okay? Because we, well, we have to make a choice. And on an exam, it'd be, um, you would say, well, you know, this most closely aligns with the scientific domain and and if you said other and you gave a justification was I didn't feel like it aligned well to any so I chose other well okay that that's that's where you're at okay so let's say it's scientific okay so now we boil this down to just this row okay that's great that there's 50 that doesn't really help us here okay so 15 to 1800 what was ours ours was 10 Oh, okay, sorry, 28 to 790. Okay, so we're, thank you, so there's 35 projects in scientific, okay. Um, so we're a little outside of the range, so then maybe this isn't quite as applicable as we thought. Um, so um, now you, um, the, for example's sake, Let's say that the, est the, the estimated size was 100,000 lines of code. Now you're starting to say, who else are we hiring to do this? Because <laughs> I wanted to graduate before my kids, you know, graduated. Um, and so, okay, so if it's 100,000 lines of code, is that in the range? It is. Okay. And so um, we could, if, if we apply the average productivity here so then what do we have which domain so we're using scientific and then um, we have a hundred thousand lines of code and we're going to divide that by 195 lines of code per staff month okay so staff month is the denominator of the denominator so then it's the the numerator so then we're going to get so then we're going to get 100,000 divided by 95, 512.8. Uh, 512.8, what's the unit? Yeah. Staff month, okay. Right, you got to keep track of your units, or, okay. So, um, it, 
Um, and if it makes you feel better, you could do to be able to grasp this a little bit more. Divide that by 12. So um, so that's 42. Is that right? That that that's terrible. <laughs> A hundred thousand with ninety five and then divide by two forty two point seven staff years. <laughs> okay, so um, that's a pretty big project. Is there any more that goes into this um, estimate for effort? What we need to acknowledge is that there is a range here based on our benchmark data. Our range is, um, so we, we, we just use the single average here, but the range is 130 to 360. So let, let's see. So, a hun so then the range is 100,000 divided by 130. And so 769.2, so 769.2 staff months. Um, to 100,000 divided by what? 360. So. Two hundred and twenty-seven. So uh, depends on how productive we are, or how good of a stipend we give the grad students, or 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 um, staff months, and we could calculate these into years if we want. So it would it would behoove us to not just say, oh, it's going to take five hundred twelve staff months, but uh, it could take anywhere from seven hundred sixty-eight to two hundred and seventy-seven staff months. Okay. We're still at um, we're still at 23 years though, so that's still a little scary. This is this is a big project, and and so and that's where this the, this data is large projects, right? And so uh, maybe you're hoping like, can we go back to the 10,000? <laughs> and even then, that's 2.3 staff years. Okay, well that that's uh, manageable, but th that's how we use the benchmark data to say okay, um, uh, as once we have our size and if we feel like the the benchmark is is applicable, then then we can do that. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. I'll, so that was lines of code instead of lines of code benchmarks. You can probably guess there's a theme going here. You can use function point benchmark data if if you're in that camp and you feel like function points are are gonna um, be a lot more appropriate. And so then, if you have an estimate of how many function points um, your project entails, then you can look up benchmarks and say, okay, well, other scientific projects that had that were within this range of um, function points here, they require that they were able to uh, produce it with with this much productivity, and therefore we can assume as an estimate that that's uh, what's going to work for us. Okay. Okay. So you can see why how that can be quick and easy. It, assuming that you have the size, an accurate size estimate, and you have the benchmark data. Okay. Okay, let's talk about analogy. So first off, let me just make sure we're all on the same page here. What does analogy mean in English? So here in my dictionary it says analogy is a, a comparison between two things, typically for the purpose of explanation or clarification, with the example sentence being 
An analogy between the workings of nature and those of human societies he interprets logical functions by analogy with machines. Okay, so an, we're, we're using an analogy. And so this is in some ways um, related to uh, benchmarking. So if, um, if we have a similar project, whereas benchmarking is we have similar projects, this is if we have a similar project, then estimation can be very accurate, which is our goal, right? And easy, which is also our goal. Okay, and so, um, so this is this is a preferred approach if you have again the caveat if you have a similar project that that you can estimate from because what it does it leverages the past which is no longer an, an estimate so um, you might be asking well what's a good engineering rule for similar project and the 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 best practices is that it's got to be within 25 percent okay so if you feel like this project is not within 25 percent you shouldn't use it for an analogy approach we need to find a different project or use a different methodology okay so if you don't have that though if you don't have a similar project you could do some pilot work and have a representative sample and then base estimates on that this is assuming of course your project could be divided up and then it, uh, we could extrapolate from the sample to to the whole but that might work really well or if you nobody's ever done this before type of a thing or there's not reliable data so let's talk about how it works okay step one choose a similar project okay and now let's talk about that a little bit you want it to be similar in every point possible in structure uh, users and environment in the language that it, it's being developed in um, in the, the programming language I guess also to some degree it would make a difference if you're going from a uh, romance language in one project and the other ones in Chinese uh, but those can have significant differences um, maybe not the biggest clarification but just yeah consider that um, and then in, in several other points and so the more similar of course the better because partly we need to make sure we're under that 25 percent threshold okay um, okay so that's step one I think that's straightforward so then step two is to estimate or we could use the word uh, quantify the differences as modifiers okay so wh what are we trying to to what areas are we looking at? We're looking at system feature complexity. We're looking at menus and screens. We're looking at database structure. We're looking at interfaces. We're looking at staff familiarity with um, the development environment. Did you just switch environments or have we used that environment before? We, we, we want to quantify difference in the development. Uh, what is the development environment? And also the development team experience. Do you have a veteran team? Do you have a whole bunch of newbies? Well, what is it? Um, and then what about the customer's environment? So do, does that take things into account? And so what we do is then we, we come up and, and we say, okay, so for each of these, we're going to say, okay, this one is 15% different, for example. 15% different from our similar project to the one we're trying to estimate. 
And so then we have a, a multiplier. This is 1.15 is our multiplier. And then if we say, you know, menus and screens, that, that's our modifier here. And what we do is we take the take the product of all of the modifiers. Okay, so we multiply them all together. Sorry, product. I said product. Product of all the modifiers to get a compound modifier. Okay, and now with this compound modifier, we're saying this represents um, all of the the changes uh, for that. And so let's just use, for example, let's say they all came out to be um, 1.25 as our compound modifier. Okay, but we need we we need to go through and um, work out the example but so that takes us we need that for step three step three is to estimate or quantify the costs okay and so let me just pull up a, a table here so I don't have to type it again so it, we would have a cost element and we'd break it up by requirement specification so uh, the similar system might have required 20 staff months just on the specifications well then we apply our compound modifier of 1.25 to 20 to say okay you know what they, they said 20 but um, we feel like it's going to take us 25 okay and then would go through for product design, detailed design, code and unit testing, uh, system test, integration test, training, project management, admin, is there any third party software? And, and what about hardware costs? And then we get a total of all of those costs and estimates as our overall costs. Now, now what if the the similar project, for example, has a third-party cost, but we don't anticipate any third-party costs, or vice versa. We already know that we want to pay a licensing for this, some library or something. What, what we do is we just put an estimate on there um, of how much it's going to cost and or um, how many staff months are going to need to integrate it, etc. So we need to apply some common sense and some good engineering practice here to, um, you know, if, if Theirs required extensive training, um, and ours didn't. Or um, this is our team's second project, and so we've ironed out some of the details on developing the training materials. Then, then that could be there. So let me reiterate that this is a preferred approach. With what's the caveat? if you have similar projects, a, a similar project, okay? And, and so th that, that's the crux of it is, is it similar and then how well did we, were able to gauge the differences there? Okay, let me just uh, introduce proxy points and then we'll wrap up for today so that we have appropriate time to give to them uh, next week. So. Um, again, proxy, that's, that's a term that we might not all be familiar with. So let's look it up in my dictionary here. Proxy, 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 proxy. Okay, proxy, the authority to represent someone else. No, I think we're more number two there. A figure that can be used to represent the value of something in a calculation with an example sentence of being the use of a, of a US wealth measure as a proxy for true worldwide measure. And we might disagree with that sentence, but um, so it's a figure that can be used to represent something else in it, especially like in a calculation. So here, proxy points are going to use inputs, um, the inputs are external characteristics uh, 
and so such as screens, uh, inputs, uh, use cases, okay? And here the inputs, the external, the, the external characteristics are proxies. They're acting in behalf of, uh, for size, okay? So instead of saying, we're going to estimate size, and then that's going to give us our schedule. It's we're going to use these external characteristics in lieu of size to be able to get at um, our schedule and things like that. Um, the So there are three main methods, proxy points, that are used in uh, as proxy points. Okay. And they are uh, function points. And so this is probably the most uh, widely used proxy point method. We've talked a lot about it. Okay. There is um, object points. And this is used in Kokomo 2. Anybody heard of Kokomo already? In other searches and whatnot. Okay. And then there's the use case, which might be the, considered the new kid on the block. Use case points. And they have, um, have already been shown, at least in certain examples, to outperform um, even expert opinion. Okay, so that, that seems like a, a good approach to take. Okay, um, be, so let's stop here before we get more into uh, the proxy, each one of the proxy methods. Are there any questions? Okay, well great. Um, that, that concludes today's video. Make sure you look at that paper for next Tuesday and uh, write a summary and provide some discussion points on that. Okay.